U.S. Marnish Radio is part of designnetwork.org, exclusive architecture and design podcasts reaching creative listeners worldwide. Hello, I'm Heather Rigdon. My new album may or may not be coming out, but please stay tuned and listen to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Peter Bolin and Peter Gluck are two of the most innovative architects in residential modernist design. In careers spanning over 14 decades, if we add them all together, their award-winning practices created several hundred award-winning houses, which you can see at usmodernist.org slash Gluck and usmodernist.org slash Bolin, B-O-H-L-I-N. Later on today, we'll spend a few minutes with our new TikTok sensation, Louisa Whitmore. And now, still trying to get an interview with Weird Al Yankovic, your host, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Hey, thank you, Tom. Ah, yes, I keep trying with Weird Al. Not many people realize that Weird Al, before he got famous singing satirical songs, he was an architecture student in California. Got his degree in everything. So, Weird Al, if you're listening, and we hope you are, please get in touch. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin and by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. In our continuing space saga, it's Episode 3, Revenge of the Developers. The modernist homeworld is crumbling from deferred maintenance. The Farnsworth House, moved from Earth 3,000 years ago because the Fox River always wins, is now an IHOP, still promoting $2.99 all-you-can-eat pancakes. Yum. Desperate for cash, the modernists sell one of the planet's moons to Home Depot as a galactic superstore. Under attack by ruthless Republic developer Lady Ivanka XIV and her consort Justin, modernist Senator Angela Roll sweeps into the Republic capital and replaces all the dilithium energy crystals with Folgers crystals. Initially, of course, no one can tell the difference, but as the Republic's power source shuts down, a rich, pleasing Colombian aroma covers mm. the planet, saving the day. Senator Angela Roll flees inside an Ikea freighter headed out to serve tasty meatballs and sell sturdy furniture across the galaxy. Back here on Earth, Senator Angela's great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother, realtor Angela Roll, uses her architectural training to specialize in modernist real estate, advising buyers and sellers on everything from appropriate renovation to getting the IKEA employee discount. Angela Roll is your special real estate agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L. Or call her at 919-995-0550. Peter Bolin was born in New York City and attended Rensselaer and the Hogwarts of Architecture Design, Cranbrook. He founded Bolin Powell in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania back in 1965, which later became Bolin Sawinski Jackson. Known for the design of Apple stores, plus a little 66,000-square-foot starter home for Bill and Melinda Gates, with past podcast guest James Cutler, Peter's practice won the 1994 AIA Firm Award, the 2020 AIA Gold Medal, plus many, many, many state and national AIA Honor Awards. Welcome, Peter Bullen. Hi. Great to be here. Thank you. Peter Gluck is with us, too. He grew up in Scarsdale, New York. He trained at Yale, studying under Paul Rudolph, James Sterling, and Henning Larson. After designing houses for a few years, Gluck went to Tokyo to design large projects. He returned in 1972 to start Peter Gluck and Partners, which over time became Gluck Plus, a highly successful design-build firm specializing in high-end modernist houses. Welcome, Peter Gluck. It's good to be here. All right, gentlemen, before we get started, I have to ask, have you two met before, maybe at a conference somewhere? I think we may have said hello. I think we've been at the same place a couple of times. And I've seen one or two of Peter's houses and always admired his work. I can't tell you how exciting it is to have you both on the show, having discovered your work in the last couple of years and the, the really massive amount of amazing houses that the two of you have 
designed over the last 14 decades. Peter Gluck, you didn't know you wanted to be an architect, I think, until your sophomore year when you attended a lecture by Vincent Scully. Tell our audience about Scully. Uh, Scully was an incredible teacher, an incredible showman. It was, it was the heroic time for, for modernist architecture before the postmodern period sort of hit. He just made so many people have so, so much fun listening to him talk about Greek architecture and the heroics of modern architecture. We used to go, I think I took, took his course five or six times. Every year in architecture school, we would all go and boo and throw bananas at him, and he would fall the stage, and uh, it was it was it was fantastic. He must have had a sense of humor, huh? Yeah, he, he was great. But he, an awful lot of really good clients came from his course. I think that was his real intention was not so much to develop architects, but to develop clients, as he would say. And I, I've repeated it many times. There are a lot more good architects than there are good clients. And without good clients, there's no good architecture. Oh. Boy, ain't that the truth. Peter Gluck, you designed a number of really cool small houses while you were still in school in the early 60s. And they were featured in Progressive Architecture in 1967, which was huge for you. Are those houses, are they still around? We've been trying to find them. Uh, yes, actually, two of them still are. Um, and some of them are not. But it's remarkable the two of them are. And there, there's another one, in, oddly enough, in Happy Adventure Newfoundland. And I'm not sure whether it's, whether it's extant or not. But it, it's, it's great to go back and see those houses. I, in fact, recently I've, I've been back to see a couple of them. There. It reminds me of those days, which were quite different from today. Are there any of them occupied by the people who commissioned them in the first place? No, I think those people are all dead. Oh, yeah, this was our early 60s, 1962. There was a yeah, beach house in right. Sagaponac, New York. Uh, there was one yeah, in that West one, Hampton. that one is gone. That one okay. is gone. I think that land is probably worth, you know, a thousand times what the house cost, the original house. It should be said that I was, I was building some of those houses with my own hands. That was the uh, theory of the time. Actually, as, as our school projects, we actually built them on the weekends. And that's what started my interest in construction and not separating design from construction, which we're still seriously involved in. And you did a house for your parents in West Hampton? Yeah, that was one of them. That one, that one's still there, actually. Okay, cool. Peter Bolin, you've worked on the Apple stores all around the world, plus you worked on the Bill and Melinda Gates house. So I have to ask, what computer do you use, a PC or a Mac? I use a pencil. A pencil. <laughs> But I'm Apple-based when I deal with that. Okay. I've found that, well, computers are essential to much of what we all do. I've found that pencils, as uh, certainly Peter would know, are an extension of your mind and your hand. And there is much more nuance in a pencil as a tool. And so I've never given them up. I'm the only one in my office that uses a pencil. Peter, how about you? Um, I use a pencil almost exclusively. There are others here and there. You know, I practice who do use pencils, yes. And some that draw beautifully. Peter Bolin, now pencils are part of your DNA, right? Well, yes, my dad made pencils. <laughs> uh, worked for Eberhard Faber. He'd be sad to see that I'm using a good a Japanese pencil now, which I think is the best that I've found. Is Faber still around? Nope. They were bought by Faber-Castell. Remember, Eberhard Faber was an American company, although mm-hmm. they had an operation in Germany. But they now are owned by Faber-Castell. My dad, when he showed me about drawing when I was very young, certainly things like knowing not how to do a perspective, but how to see perspectives and how to see everything not in uh, one dimension. And that was truly a great thing for me to develop, have a sense of from an early age. And Peter Boland, tell us about those special Japanese pencils, because I've seen you, when we've met, carry those around. Well, they're Itoya, uh, made by Itoya, and I just like the ones that happen to be colored in red, that they make a number of other colors, but they just have a perfect lead. They're very light, and they truly then are an extension of yourself. 
in my case at least, I can zip through uh, thoughts much more swiftly this way than on a computer. And yet I know that computers more and more now can be very useful. But I think doing these things more directly in your head, and in my case, using my hand, gets closer to that connection between us as architects and people, whether people we work with or people for whom we're doing things, such as people who shop at a place like Apple, getting at the nature of places, whether it's a natural topography or an urban place, getting at the nature of the sun, the wind, and so on. Right. And so that's what I admire about architects from the past, and I believe it makes for richer modernism. Peter Gluck, tell us about your time at Yale, the Yale Building Project, and the design-build culture that was emerging at that time. It seemed like the, the AIA wasn't real keen about that when it started. They're still not keen about it. That's why you won't see AIA after my name. Yeah, we um, didn't quite understand why, as kids, four of us in particular, we really loved the idea of building, and that's what got us interested in architecture, besides Ben Scully, and it came together. I was fascinated by watching buildings being built. N- never had any idea what an architect was or how, how the whole system worked. So it was a time when things were really inexpensive, and you could build. I, I built a house for my parents for $12,000 worth of materials. That's worth more than that today. But we just felt that we could do it. There was a statement that I still use today is if if a roofer can do it, I should be able to do it. So we just worked together and take us two or three weekends to frame a house. And then we would work another couple of months and and do the plumbing, electric, and everything. When we got to a new trade, we would go to the hardware store and buy a book and learn how to do it. And it's uh, it's been tr- tremendous, um, I guess, love for me just watching things getting built. And now we're building, designing and building large 16, 18-story buildings. Tr- tremendous advantages from the design point of view and from a production point of view and every conceivable way. And I guess it eliminates arguments between your architect and your builder. <laughs> At the same person, we're, we're, all, we're everybody in my office is both builder and architect. We're all architects, but we don't hire specifically construction people. So the way it works is that people start with their preliminary design and go all the way through becoming job supers and running the job and doing layout and contract administration. You know, construction contract administration. Most of the people here just really love that breadth of of experience and the control we have over our buildings. So what was the AIA's resistance to architects being builders? They felt that construction is where all the liability existed. And since since they were all lawyers, what they were mostly concerned about was liability. And so that they've gradually taken architects away from the construction of their buildings so that after two or three generations of architects, and we're past that now, architects have really very little knowledge of, of how a building gets together and what it's all about. And yet, they're the ones that are supposed to be making the drawings and the manuals for making a building, but they don't really know how to make them. But you have also inspired a number of design-build practices, particularly in residences around the country. Yes, I am trying desperately to do that because I'm really worried about the profession of architecture, but that, that's a whole other story. But that stems from this giving away more and more of what we're supposed to do so that eventually we're going to be making cartoons and somebody else is going to be doing everything else. Peter Boland? And I would say in support of what Peter Gluck's been describing, you know, I went to an undergraduate school, a very good one, that was much more technically based. And I've always felt that as we move away from, as Peter's describing, a process of building, but also away from understanding how things are made, about the nature of the materials we use, all of those things, that we're making more diagrams that are not necessarily influenced by the nature of all these things around us, whether they're people or what we build with or how we build. And if you look back at primitive buildings from, in many cases, thousands of years ago, There was so much more of a connection between people and the materials and the making and how it is in the climate 
because they would not have survived if they did do that. And I believe we've also given away all of those abilities. So I think it goes beyond even the legal aspects, which I think is correct. It goes extremely deep into how the kind of architecture that we make. Absolutely. Peter Bolin, your work first came to national attention in 1975 when you designed a house for your parents in Connecticut, the Forest House, that was on the cover of the New York Times magazine. This was an era when architects like you and Charles Gwathme and Richard Meyer had their parents be one of their first big commissions. It was. And how did they like their house? Oh, they loved it. And you know, that's the second house I did. My mom and dad, the first was the first house that we did as architects. And that was in Pennsylvania, where my mom and dad lived at the time. And that also was in the Times. And I figured my mom out, I'd say, within six inches on her kitchens. And it was not just a technical issue. It was how she was comfortable. You know, I mean, most things are not purely technical. They have to do with people's sensibilities. And they're quite different if you've seen both, except they both are touching buildings. They are emotionally laden, but they're really quite different in the way they're built and you know, all those aspects. Peter Gluck, you've taught at Columbia and Yale in their architecture schools. What lessons do you hope your students take away from you? Well, I, I mean, we lived in a different era. I'd like to call it a kind of heroic era. Criticism was kind of direct and brutal. The major lesson emotionally about being an architect is that you have to have thick skin and you have to be able to handle criticism and you have to be able to profit from criticism rather than getting away from it. Because if you're worried about what people think of your buildings, you're not going to make good buildings. The only reason to teach is to see more good buildings. And it's, it's sad when there are so few and when the profession has less and less influence on what the built environment actually is. I know that both of you were widely published when you started out, but you also got a lot of traction in Japan. I believe that GA Houses picked up a number of your projects. Is that right, Peter Bolin? Yes, as well as uh, elsewhere, such as the Italian publications. When I started uh, with Dick Powell, I practice in Wilsbury, which is early 60s, mid-60s. I thought almost surely I would be moving to New York or elsewhere after doing my mom and dad's house. That I couldn't survive in a place that northeastern Pennsylvania is. However, the publication of those continued. And I know that as we opened other practices and other studios elsewhere, opportunity and the wish to widen our base. However, the publications turned out to be critical to much of the work that we've done. For instance, when Steve Jobs hired us first to do Pixar before Apple, he said, Peter, I'm hiring you in many of our practice, of course, because you do very large, good, large buildings, quite good, and you do great houses. Now, he was an unusual client, but still, it's those publications that carry through. And I'm sure that's uh, true of many of us. Peter Gluck, how about you and those publications? <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, we, we always think that, that the lifeblood of our, of our work comes from publishing and, and that uh, publishing is how one prevails. I, I'm not sure to what degree that's the case now. I think that the publications are getting thinner and thinner, and, it, and it's, it's harder and harder to get any real information. I think that the online publications are much better than the paper, and I think maybe in, in the next few years, publications will be important again. But God, there was a period of years there where there's just so little, and, and the main thing that the general public looked at was things like Architectural Digest, which is like you know, pillows and foot wraps and things, you know, just, just not architecture. <laughs> like superficial stuff. Yeah. But Peter, I agree with you about all of this. However, the irony is that we've gotten a few very good projects because of publications in the Digest. So. Yeah, we have two. We have two. 
it's disappointing the level of criticism that exists and then the level of, of education, what we're trying to talk about now. How, how does the public get educated about architecture? Has Architectural Digest become more mainstream, less, I guess, serious than it was in the past? Or well, one of the things about always mainstream. Yeah. One of the things about Architecture Digest is that up until about the 70s, it was really a, a quintessential publication for architecture of all styles. You could go in and see right, yeah. these incredible photos, eight-page spreads on houses. And then it started to shift, and, and this is neither good or bad, but it started to shift much more towards interior design and specific furnishings and things like that. And then by the 90s, it was picking up more on celebrity houses. Uh, so it, it shifted yeah. its focus. I'm sure that marketed well Yeah, for them. Yeah. We enjoy and prefer to do the interiors on our, our buildings. We're not always able to do that. But we get great pleasure from it. And I think the interaction of how we use a building or a house, let's say, and that's one great reason that one loves doing houses, is has to do with furnishing and all aspects of those places where people live. And so yeah, absolutely. I, I like to design furniture. I do too, and then we also feel the same way about landscape. We, we'd like to, to do most of the conceptual landscape work and then deal with landscapers who understand the specifics of the plants, but we would never design us and, and give so-called landscaping to somebody else to do. No, but over your life, there are landscape architects, for instance, that are quite amazing, as there are engineers. And I do love to work with those people that seem so sensitive. I'm learning from them all the time. But often, you're right, particularly as our work is scattered, that you really have to take a rather strong hand as well. And that's how I feel about interiors as well. Peter Gluck, your firm has made a commitment to building affordable housing, such as the Aspen Project. How does your firm approach that, particularly when so many people want affordable housing but don't want it in their neighborhoods? And they don't really want it, do they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> They like the idea. Um, Twenty years ago, we we decided that we wanted our practice to be split between um, the inner city and work that generally doesn't get done by architects, and the sort of high end fancy work that, that is done by architects. And so we moved to Harlem, and we our practice is kind of split between doing those kinds of, of projects with which architects don't try to get, and consequently don't get and then ultimately don't have the ability to work under those conditions. So we, we like to think that we do um, affordable housing and unaffordable housing. <laughs> well, that's a good combination. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sums it, it up. The, the hard part is in the middle. But it's a difficult world, and we're, we're trying to figure out how to deal with the uh, affordable housing world. We've done some pretty interesting things with um, prefabrication and off-site construction and because we are so involved in construction, we, we feel that this is all sort of part of what we need to do. I should say that the next project that I did when I was young, and is still in the 60s, was a modular housing system, which I designed and built. A couple of projects using prefabricated wall panels. And the, the Aspen project was also prefabricated. The, the wall panels were prefabricated and cost less than if we had bought the lumber at the lumber yard. Wow. So th those are the kinds of things that we're, we investigate with all of our buildings, hoping to make the building cost less money so that we can dedicate that ad additional money, which is usually just lost money, dedicate that to better design, better materials, and the kinds of things that uh, often architects are not capable of doing because the, the pressure, the, the terrible pressure of budget on all projects. And that's getting worse. That challenge is getting more difficult, particularly during the pandemic. Materials are really jumping. Incredible in, price in jumps call. on those, yes. Yep. You know, when I was at Cranbrook, Aero was not only alive and working quite nearby, and many of my friends worked in his office, but Eames came back quite often, both to see Aero and he stopped in the studios at Cranbrook. And I've always truly admired 
the house that Ray and, and Charles did for themselves. Again, because it was, much of it was off the shelf. And it was a much richer architecture than what he would have done and what Arrow did earlier nearby in California. There's a house just down the drive. So I think using off the shelf, which we are still doing on some jobs, is really intriguing. And also reusing materials other than the common ones, such as the project we've done at Pocono Environmental Education Center. We took the edge wall and covered it with tires, in effect, using those materials as a way to sort of introduce people to the building as they sort of move through that wall into a passive solar great space. Yeah, so we're um, also spending a lot of time understanding where things are made. Like a building might have major pieces of it from all over the world. The glass can yeah. come from Europe. The curtain wall systems are, and kitchens and millwork, they come from all over the world. Now, the sourcing is not the local lumberyard anymore. The sourcing is the world. Actually, the transportation yeah. costs are, are so small relative to the differentials in prices. And because of the differentials in labor across the world, and, and also yeah. actual mining of materials, it's a fascinating world now where everything is up for grabs. Now, Peter Gluck, what do clients need to understand better about prefabs? Because the idea of this has been around for a long, long time, but it's not something that's really taken the American building industry by storm yet. There is no aggregated market for it. So prefabrication, the implication is that you design this, this perfect piece that can be replicated hundreds of times and therefore, in the replication comes the cost savings and the focus on quality, both design and material. Since there's no aggregated market, you can't set up a production when one year there's no construction, then there's a blitz for six months, then there's no more construction for a couple of years. So it, people have talked about it for a long time, but it's, it, it's never worked in this country, and I don't think it ever will. What is happening is off-site construction. As I was just saying, stuff is built in different places and shipped and assembled. So, so now it's really a question of assemblage on-site and fabrication of the pieces somewhere else. How is that different from prefab as we tend to think of it? I think prefab tends to mean that the entire thing is being built in one spot okay. in a factory-like world. So this is more modular? Well, I mean, a modern window, if you go to an Anderson window and you look, you really look at it closely, it's an incredibly sophisticated piece of prefabrication. Okay. It used to be that you'd build the windows on the, on the site and you'd take all the sticks and you cut the glass and put it. Now, you just have a hole in the wall and you just stick this on it, tack it, and put some plastic oh, around yeah. it and it's done. But in fact, that you know, 98% of that piece is an assemblage which was made somewhere else. It's, in fact, prefabrication. The technology really has changed and continues to change. Uh, Peter Bolin, Jim Cutler told us that one of the problems of the Bill and Melinda Gates house over time is that the technology got a lot smaller and wireless. When you upgraded the house, you were left with these large holes for these giant monitors that were popular <laughs> in the 90s and miles of wiring. Do you see that being common as you try to upgrade these houses? Well, it depends. In the case of the Gates house, Jim was talking about the technology. And you would predict in our world, and in certainly those particular technologies, that change will be quite rapid. And therefore, you've really got to design to accommodate change. You could argue that certain parts of where people live may be very personal and quite adjustable for people. But on the other hand, there are parts of buildings that would and should change over time, not because of changing technology, but I think just because of how people feel, like the nature of windows. It's a technical thing, and we've learned to do more with less. It's on the Apple stores. Very little of that glass came from the U.S. It was we could get better glass in Europe and pushed the technology there easily. 
but also then as we did more Apple stores in Asia, Apple subsidized their development of much more sophisticated glazing, for instance, very large sheets of glass that have curved than we were capable of doing here. And so I think in a way you could say that there are certain things about houses that can be quite fudgeable in a very personal way. So they're yours. And other things that are much more technically sophisticated and not change. Peter Gluck, aside from technology, and I know this could be a whole show we could do with you, how does the profession of architecture need to change? It's very simple. I think architects have to stop their primary concern, which at the present time is avoiding risk, avoiding liability. And they should become more involved in the total process of making a building. Are there any young architects out there today that you admire? I would say half the architects that come out of school are really interested in this and are really frustrated by the fact that they're beginning to realize that their role in the production of a building is going to be as minor as, as it looks like it is. So I think that younger kids are really interested in, in getting their hands dirty and getting involved in, let's say, accepting the risk that comes from being involved in an enterprise as opposed to living under an institution whose primary concern is avoiding risk. Well, clearly, Peter, you have solved this problem. I mean, you've figured out a way to manage the risk of building all these buildings that you've built. I mean, there is an answer, right? I would say there's much less risk, but that's not the way it's perceived. If you realize that the only person in a construction of a, of a building, the only person that's personally liable, personally responsible for the building is the architect. And when he sticks his stamp on those drawings, he is the person who is involved. Now, it can be a large project and no one else, not the contractor, not the subcontractors, not the laborers. Nobody is personally responsible except him. Now, why would you design a building under those circumstances and then hand it off to somebody, somebody else to build it? without your having any control over it. That sounds pretty risky to me. I, 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 <laughs> I, I would never want to be in that position ever again. Every time that we are, we, we wind up with the same horrible problems with the process that's been dealt. Do you feel that the uh, Florida condo collapse has made things like that worse? The risk scarier? Sure. The, the lawyers love it. It's great. Yeah. Peter Bolin, our friends, the classicists, like to call modernist buildings cold. But architecture critic Paul Goldberger has described you as a romantic modernist <laughs> who's had a more emotional yep. impact on traditionalism. Is that accurate? Well, yes. Uh, I, I don't use the term romantic. I would say I talk about humanism. But in truth, it means the same, I think. And I admire people and, and some of the early modernists, such as Leverance, for instance, the Swede, I admire that he made modernism that was also very personal. And some of his later buildings are particularly fascinating. And so I feel modernism can have many of the qualities that we may admire in certain ancient buildings or some very new buildings that people truly love. And that would be my greatest pleasure. And I do believe that's possible at the scale of houses more than it is very large buildings. Now, we do those too. But then I think, obviously, you want to concentrate, among other things, on what people touch that you can deal with, like a railing or hardware or a portion of a stair and so on and so on. Because humans can have the pleasure of interacting and I think those emotional qualities are all around us, the possibilities. And I think that Paul would call it a romantic modernism, and I would call it a much more humane modernism. Peter Gluck, for you, what makes a good client? Someone who's willing to go on a journey without knowing what the destination is. <laughs> Trusting you. Most people think of buildings as, as an object, a piece of money. They want to know what it's going to be like. They want to kick the tire. They, it's like they want to buy a car. They want to know exactly what it's going to be like before they sign up for it because there, there's a risk in their being surprised. There's also a lot of them are afraid that their friends and family think that they made a mistake. So they're fearful of just 
saying, let's put your project, put a magnifying glass on your project and say, what does it want to be? What are all the things that you are aspiring for? And how do we get there? And let's go through a process to get there. We, none of us know where we're going, but we're, but we're going to get there and it's going to be very special. That's a tough thing to buy. And there are very few people that have the courage to do that. And when you find a client who has got courage, you're going to get a much better building than you can ever imagine. Because there are a lot of good architects and there aren't many people who are willing to take that trip. But we are lucky enough those people find us, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. To me, the greatest joy that I have in designing is becoming personal friends with, with clients who called cold on one day and having a 30- or 40-year relationship with them and seeing them enjoy the house over time. I mean, that is to me, that is the ultimate joy. And those are friendships that mean. often extend throughout your life. Yeah, exactly. Only about half of our buildings are houses. The other half are we do a lot of schools. We're doing a lot of film stages and condo buildings, larger residential buildings. Well, for instance, we did a school about 15 years ago that our people teach inner city school and they teach on weekends. They put me on the board of the school. It's a relationship that goes way beyond architecture. And then that, to me, is the greatest, the greatest kick when that actually happens. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. I would love to talk with you all afternoon. You can see all their houses at usmodernist.org slash gluck, that's G-L-U-C-K, and usmodernist.org slash bolin, that's B-O-H-L-I-N. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you. And take care. And thank you so much, George. And now a few minutes with Louisa Whitmore. Hi, I'm Louisa Whitmore, and today I'll be talking about Farnsworth House, a 1,500-square-foot modernist home on the banks of the Fox River in Plano, Illinois. It was designed by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe for Edith Farnsworth, who I believe missed out on her predestined career as a butler in a kind of bad British murder mystery to become a very successful nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor in case you didn't know. I didn't. The house completed construction in 1951 and has become famous as an example of modernist architecture. Unfortunately, unlike Falling Water, I don't have the benefit of it being like the most famous house in the world, so I'll have to describe its appearance a little bit. I like to think of modernist homes as being all or nothing. You see everything or you see nothing, and this is a see-everything house. Picture, if you will, a large rectangular metal slab parallel to the ground and held up 5 feet 3 inches above it by stilts. That number's not important, it's just accurate. Now imagine a glass box on top of that metal slab. It's not the same size, but it takes up about mm, 70% of the square footage. On top of it is an identical metal slab. This is Farnsworth House, and when I said it's a house where you see everything, I meant it. In fact, the only things you can't see from the outside are the kitchen and the toilet which are contained in a quote-unquote wood core in the middle of the house. Everything else, eating, living, sitting, sleeping areas, is contained in this one entirely glass room. If you're having trouble imagining it, picture the car showroom from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but on stilts and not in the woods. That building, by the way, is a different glass mid-century modernist architectural marvel in Illinois, coincidentally. Farnsworth House, though, it's very not private. It was created as one big glass room so the occupant could connect with the nature around it, which, I mean, it's good that the nature's there because if there were other houses around it, it would just become the most uncomfortable neighbor experience of all time. This house two is deceptively simple. Not only does it look like a house I'd build in Minecraft when I don't want to put effort into it, and I tried, it took me five minutes, but it also has no visible bolts, screws, nails, or connecting joints of any kind. It's just smooth. And that was on purpose. Construction cost a lot of money and it went way over budget, partially due to that smoothness. Since it was constructed, Farnsworth House has been experiencing a problem I have to say I did not expect a house on stilts to have flooding. Almost every year, the Fox River overflows and floods the estate and several times the house along with it. Over time, it's damaged the structure and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which owns Farnsworth House, is trying to find a solution that won't change the appearance or design of the house. What they've settled on is to use a hydraulic lift to lift up the house above the water and then put it back down when the water recedes. However, that would cost a lot of money, but... Hopefully they'll be able to raise that money and save the house without changing its appearance as much as my idea would, which was just make the stilts taller. Like, I feel like we could have started there. Maybe when it was constructed. I don't know. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin, and by... 
modernist realtor, Angela Roll. Okay, Tom, close us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist mom Carrie Cesarino tries to keep her young girls from too much screen time, yet mommy's on her screen all the time. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild, George, and I'll be back soon with another Peter-themed edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Yeah, how about Gabriel or Frampton? Sure, or Satara or Gum and the Wolf.